Bolinani, along with my colleague Drisha, will be discussing on how to protect your brand name globally. So before going into the webinar as such, uh, I'll just brief you on what all topics we'll be covering in this webinar. So firstly, I'll be discussing on what an intellectual property is. Then I'll be uh, discussing shortly on what a trademark and how a brand can be protected in India or in any other jurisdiction. And also I'll be discussing on how to choose a strong uh, trademark and the importance of securing trademark registration. Now, this is the first part of the webinar. And the second part of the webinar will be taken by uh, my colleague, Grisha. She'll be focusing more on uh, global trademark protection and how uh, an international applications can be filed these would be discussed by uh, Drishya. Uh, firstly, uh, intellectual property is uh, something which is created using the intellect of a person. So whenever a person creates something using his intellect or using his mind, such things can be protected under IP. So IP is also an intangible asset uh, where uh, you can uh, secure protection for your creations. Now, uh, IPs or intellectual property can be uh, of various types, uh, including uh, patent, copyright, trademarks, industrial designs, geographical indications, plant varieties, and trade secrets. In this webinar, uh, I'll be uh, more focusing on trademark, and I'll also be briefly discussing on what patent, copyright, and industrial designs are. Uh, coming to the first type of intellectual property, copyright. Copyright is something which the creator or the owner of an original work gets whenever he creates such a work. Now, by copyright, a person would be getting the right to copy, distribute, adapt, display, or perform the creative work. Now, what works can be protected under copyright include literary, artistic, cinematographic work, paintings, musical compositions, etc. So, all these can be protected using copyright law. Now, one important thing to be noted uh, in copyright is that uh, registration or copyright registration is not mandatory. So when a person creates a work, then copyright would automatically get uh, subsisted or automatically it subsists on the creation of the work. Registration as such is not mandatory for copyright. Now, so you might think of why registration would be necessary in copyright uh, registrations are necessary because if if you're going for an uh, infringement action in that case registration act as an evidence of protection so that is why copyright registration is important now coming to the validity of a copyright uh, copyright uh, generally are valid for entire life of the author plus certain additional years this additional year may define, depend on country wise. Uh, for example, in India, the validity is uh, entire life of the author plus 60 years. This would depend upon a uh, different country. This would vary according to the country in which the copyright is registered. Uh, the next type of intellectual property is patent. A patent is a form of intellectual property that gives its owner the legal right to exclude others from making, using or selling an invention for a limited period of time. So uh, in uh, patent, whenever a person secures patent registration, the patent registration is valid only for a limited, peer, a limited period of years. Uh, after that, the patent uh, would be published in the public domain. Uh, now, what are the things that can be patented or what items can be patented include product, processes, machines or any improvements made or compositions of matter that are new and that has a novel feature in it. Such matters or such articles can be patented. Uh, now, as said, the patentability criteria, there are three important things or three important criteria to be looked into before applying a patent. The first thing is novelty. Now, the invention or the thing which you need to uh, secure patent should be new or it should not be a part of the prior art. It should be novel. Now, the second important thing is non-obviousness. The invention should be inventive and it should have some technical advances and economic significance. Then only we can um, apply for a patent or a, or a patent would be granted only for non-obvious inventions. Now, the third important thing is utility or use. So the thing which needs to be patented has to have certain industrial use. Only those things which have use can be applied for a patent. 
coming to the validity of patent generally patents are valid for a period of 20 years as said earlier after this 20 years period it would be published in the public domain uh, the third uh, category of intellectual property is industrial design and industrial design constitute the ornamental or the aesthetic aspect of an article now uh, design registrations are uh, those registration where we might secure registration on the physical appearance of a product functional aspect is not covered under design industrial design only the physical appearance uh, for example uh, the shape of an article or the surface pattern so only such things can be protected under the industrial designs act now uh, design protection is also uh, like uh, it is only for a specific period of time for example in eu ipo the designs are valid uh, for a total period of 25 years where after every 5 years you need to renew the design applications and in india the design applications are valid for a total years of 15 years and after the uh, 10th year uh, you have to uh, file a renewal petition to further renew the same for an additional five years. Uh, coming to the main part of the webinar, that is trademark and brand name protection. Uh, trademarks are those uh, name or symbol which are used to identify the source of goods or the services. So basically, we uh, if we want to identify or uh, trademarks are those things which makes us identify the uh, source or the originator of the goods or the services. Now, uh, trademarks include a device mark. It can also include a, a word mark. It can include signatures. It can include numerals. It can include taglines. All these can be covered under the Trademarks Act. Now, uh, apart from these conventional uh, marks, conventional marks means uh, like uh, word, logo, and signature, taglines, all these are conventional trademarks. And apart from these conventional marks, there are also non-conventional uh, trademarks. Uh, non-conventional trademarks are those uh, marks which apart from their, uh, like, uh, which are identified through their uh, like characteristics or um, certain appearances that uh, if uh, th these are used to identify trademarks, then that are non-conventional trademarks. Now, the symbols TM and R used in trademarks. Uh, so we all might have seen the usage of the symbol TM and R along with certain logos or certain words. So what does this signify? The Symbol TM signifies that a trademark application has been filed with the concerned registry and the symbol R signifies the registration of a trademark. So when you see a symbol R associated with a logo or a word, it would mean that that mark is already registered with the concerned trademark registry and TM would signify that the trademark application is pending process. Validity of a trademark is again uh, 10 years and uh, it needs to be renewed after every 10 years so that you have the right over the mark. So uh, non-renewal might lead to uh, lose your trademark. So you need to renew your trademarks after every 10 years. Now, another important question which uh, you might be thinking is that can a registered trademark be used by another person? So uh, the answer to this is yes. A registered trademark of one person can be used by another person. Uh, this can be done by way of licensing agreement. So in a licensing agreement, if uh, the registered owner gives license to the other person to use his registered trademark, then such trademarks can be used by the other person. Uh, coming to recent trends in trademark. Uh, so recent trends uh, mostly include uh, on non-conventional marks. So as I have said earlier, non-conventional trademarks are uh, those marks which go beyond the conventional trademarks uh, and those marks that can be identified through their nature, characteristics and potential. Now, these non-conventional marks include uh, visible marks such as uh, color, shapes, uh, and it also includes other non-visible marks such as smell, uh, shape, taste, etc. These are the non-conventional trademarks. Now, um, one of the recent trends which you can uh, see is the registration of posters. Like uh, you might have seen certain uh, posters uh, which are associated with certain celebrities. Such posters can be registered by these celebrities in their name. 
So, for example, uh, the famous athlete Usain Bolt has applied for his uh, lightning pose, which he uses after winning a race. So, that is registered uh, under posters or non-conventional trademark. And uh, you might have also uh, seen the famous poster of uh, Shah Rukh Khan, which he had used in his famous movie. That is also his signature pose and that can also be registered as a poster mark. Now, uh, the next uh, non-conventional trademark is motion mark. Now, motion marks are those uh, marks which include an uh, as or which associate certain motion with the logo. For example, uh, whenever you might have opened Netflix, you could have uh, you would have seen uh, a motion or the Netflix opening motion. Or uh, when you have uh, opened a Windows uh, app or uh, starter uh, computer, you would have noted the Windows startup logo, which have a motion associated with the same. So that can be registered or that motion can be registered as a motion mark under the Trademarks Act. Now, in India, the first motion mark uh, to be filed was the Nokia's connecting hand. Uh, so uh, this also you might be uh, familiar with where uh, you might have seen that uh, connecting uh, motion associated with the uh, Nokia device. Uh, trademark uh, registered tra trademarks are easier to enforce as they usually carry a presumption of ownership. For example, we can uh, initiate a suit for infringement in case of a trade uh, registered trademark while, while uh, only an action of passing off can uh, be initiated for an unregistered trademark. Now, the third uh, point is that uh, trademarks are one of the most enduring assets of a uh, uh, business. So, uh, we... Uh, so uh, as a trademark lasts for a long time, it is uh, always advisable to get your trademark registered. Now, uh, also another thing is that uh, we can, uh, as I have said earlier, we can license or sell a trademark and we can uh, have income generated from these uh, licensing. So this is another aspect of uh, trademark registration. And adding to financial value is uh, an advantage again with trademark registration. Coming to a uh, trademark search. So uh, before applying a trademark application, it is uh, always advisable that you do a trademark search in the registry where you wish to apply the trademark application. So this trademark search is usually done so that we get to know if there is any uh, identical or a confusingly similar mark already in existence in that particular jurisdiction where we are seeking to apply. Uh, apart from conducting the uh, trademark search in the registry where we want to file the application, it is all. It will also be appropriate if you uh, can have a market search with respect to the uh, name in which uh, uh, on in name which you would want to apply for trademark registration. So, uh, uh, conducting trademark search in the registry where you want to file the application, and also conducting a market search search is advisable before filing a trademark application, be it in any jurisdiction. Now, uh, this is the last part of my uh, presentation. So, uh, in this, I'll be explaining you in general the registration process followed by most of the uh, trademark registry. So, once trademark search is done, uh, though trademark search is not mandatory, but it is advisable to do so. Uh, once the trademark search is done, uh, we file a trademark application which will be examined by the concerned trademark registry. After the examination is complete, uh, the uh, registry will uh, raise certain objections if they have any or any further clarifications will be raised by the registry if they want so. And uh, otherwise, the registry will accept your trademark and the same will be published in a journal. And this journal publication is done so that uh, it is a period where any third party can come and oppose your trademark uh, if they find that such marks are uh, being similar to their trademark uh, or that uh, if they think that their rights are being infringed by uh, by if, if registration is granted to you. So this is the opposition period. The journal publication is basically the opposition period where third parties can file oppositions. And once the opposition period is completed, you will get the trademark registration. This is basically the overall trademark registration process followed in uh, in most of the countries. 
So uh, this is the first part of the webinar. Uh, the second part of the webinar is all about global trademark protection, which will be dealt with by uh, my colleague, Advocate Grisha. Okay, I understand that now that we have, uh, have a general idea about what is a trademark exactly and a general concept of IP, and you know, the general procedure of registration of trademarks and how it works, uh, let's dive into global trademark protection. Now, before I go forward and you know explain the uh, concept of you know, the global data protection and the methods for it, let me just give you a brief on uh, what is the benefit of uh, getting a global trademark pr uh, protection in the first place. Now, the first one is transborder reputation, uh, of course, as the name itself suggests, right? Uh, it is the reputation and goodwill that you may hold uh, beyond borders, beyond your country, internationally, or in any other country that you're doing your business in, right? Having your trademark registration in a particular country is prima facie evidence that you, have, you are established there as a brand, and it leads consumers to believe that you are established as a brand. And the second one is establishing the goodwill of a business in a marketplace. If you are relatively new to uh, you know, a new country or a new marketplace, it will be in the beginning, of course, as you may understand, uh, difficult to establish yourself as a brand, as a working brand or as a recognized brand in those territories. So having a trademark registration will give you the benefit of the doubt and give you an upper edge over unregistered marks such that you're recognized in the market. Third one is prevention of infringement of your mark in territories that you run your business. So. Um, Wherever, so in first to five countries, which uh, first to five and first to use is a concept that I will be discussing in the next coming slides. Uh, anyway, in first to five countries, right, where territories where you are running your business um, and you do not have registered rights. So there are certain territories which, uh, which only recognize registered rights and not unregistered rights, such that even if you're using your trademark in a particular area as such, if you have not registered, they do not recognize your mark. And it's also very difficult for you to recognize infringers in these particular territories as well. So getting a trademark registration helps you mitigate and um, lets, uh, gives you an edge of um, having your remedy uh, in respect of infringement in these territories as well. Then, of course, expansion of customer base uh, across borders. Then, as my colleague has already mentioned, it adds value and certainty in your business's rights, especially not only with respect to consumers, existing consumers or potential consumers that, that have to come in the uh, later stages, but also potential investors that might look into buying or investing in your business at a later stage as well. It also provides ease in initiating adversarial actions. For instance, um, in social media platforms like, um, say, Facebook or YouTube or uh, Instagram, for instance, right? You may come across, as a business owner, uh, especially small business owners, you may come across a lot of marks that are actually infringing your mark. They have a say, uh, an identical or similar mark uh, and dedicated social media pages towards it. So instead of actually going uh, and filing an infringement suit and uh, taking the long way forward, if you if you have a registered uh, trademark, if you have a trademark registration uh, in general, right? So these social media platforms, what they do, they offer the service called uh, takedown notices. You can actually file a takedown notice if you have a registered trademark, saying that hey, I have this trademark registered and I am the sole uh, owner of this mark who's allowed to use this, and that will be processed accordingly, and you don't have to go through all of these procedures of you know going to the courts and everything okay and similarly in respect of uh, instituting any other adversarial proceedings like infringing um, infringement suits or complaints or oppositions etc for you if you have a registration it is bona fide proof it's prima facie proof that you are the sole owner of this uh, particular mark okay the next one is, of course, identification of infringers across borders. Uh, some of you might be aware of uh, a concept called customs recorder, right? So in this uh, realm of business where, you know, there is absolutely no shortage for counterfeited products or there are so many businesses that are actually selling goods that are so, so similar to yours. And it is so difficult to um, recognize or, or identify each and every one of them and infringe and stop them from doing so otherwise and seize all of these goods and stuff. So it becomes very difficult. So if you have a registered trademark, 
what you can do is you can simply go to the customs authority of your particular country, uh, say that, hey, I have a registered trademark, record yourself with the customs authority and whatever infringing goods that comes into the country after that point, they will take note of it, they will inform you and they will seize the goods until you until you confirm it otherwise, right? So it gives you an edge, uh, especially if you are in the export and uh, businesses, etc. Um, and the last one is enrollment um, in e-commerce marketplaces. I am sure many of you might be aware of Amazon brand registry where, you know, there is a mandate, uh, especially in e-commerce marketplaces like that, where you have to have a registered trademark or you have to have a pending trademark application with respect to a particular brand that you want to enroll. So this actually helps you, um, it not only does it help you widen your customer base as such in these platforms but it's also giving you the goodwill that hey i am an established brand okay and giving you that for you the exposure in that kind of a platform is very very important okay now that we have a general idea of the importance and the benefits that come with global trademark protection, let's look at the uh, methods of a global trademark application or rather the global application routes. Okay, so there are two main parts with which you can actually fight, uh, you can protect your trademark globally. One is through the metric protocol where, whereby you will file an international application through an organization uh, through the metric route or filing a direct application in any individual country which you wish to protect your market. Now, I will be discussing each of these in detail in the coming slides as well. So apart from these two, just, uh, just to clarify, apart from these two, there are so many other territories where the system in itself is a lot more different. Like, for example, there are uh, territories like Maldives, for example. There is no concept of trademark application or trademark registration in these countries. You simply uh, publish something called a cautionary notice and it's known that, you know, the trademark belongs to you, right? So in each country, the trademark rules and regulations differ. But here I am covering what is the whatever uh, major countries are covered uh, with respect to global trademark protection. That's what I'm covering in this session. Okay, so before I go forward and explain these two methods, let me just give you a basic idea of what is first to file and first to use, like I told in the first slide, right? So first to file, as of course the name itself indicates, right? There are certain countries that uh, recognize priority in filing, and there are certain countries that, um, that recognize priority in use. So there are some countries like India, which are common law countries, which uh, recognize the rights of a prior user. So for example, if you've been using your trademark for let's say 13, 14 years and you've not registered your trademark at all, and there is this another fellow who has already registered the same trademark, right? But he's either on a proposed to be used basis or he has not used the market or it's only, you know, it's many years subsequent to your adoption and use of the mark, then you will have weightage over that particular person regardless of whether or not you've filed it, right? So that is called first to use country. For first to file countries, like for example, UAE or Singapore or uh, uh, most of the GCC countries actually, it, they, these are first to file countries. So whoever files first, they will have priority over whoever has used it. So regardless of whether you use that particular trademark in that territory for 10 plus years or whatnot, it does not matter unless it is registered in these countries. Of course, there are exceptions and uh, the courts can take, you know, case to case decisions and everything. So what I'm talking about is the general overview of the picture. Okay, so now let's discuss the method system. So I will be just uh, speaking, I will not be describing the entire procedure step by step. I will just give you an overview of the system in the coming slides, right? So the method system is simply a system of international registration of trademark. It is governed by two treaties. One is the Madrid Agreement, which concerns the international registration of marks. And the another one is protocol relating to the Madrid Agreement. And any country that has acceded or rather uh, accepted this particular, uh, these treaties, right? These are called the member countries. So what the Madrid system does, it, it is a method of protection of your trademark, which offers a trademark owner a possibility to have his trademark protected in several member countries at the same time by filing a single application with his home country. And this particular application will be governed centrally by one organization called the WIPO, uh, more specifically uh, the International Bureau of WIPO or the World Intellectual Property Organization. So currently about 130 countries have acceded to the MET protocol that I think represents about maybe 65 to 70 percentage of world trade so far. 
Okay, so the overview of the system, let's just break it down to better understand what is the metal protocol, right? Now, a trademark can be protected in any number of member countries, like I said, member countries which have accepted the metal protocol by filing one single application from the home country uh, based on a basic application or basic registration, payment of one set of fees and in any of these three languages. So let me just um, explain this with an example, right? So for example, you are a person who is domiciled in India, you have your business in India, right? So you will file an international application with the Indian trademark registry. Like you will file an international application, you will give the prescribed documents, you will check whatever uh, country that you want to protect your trademark in, which, are, which have acceded to merit, you will select them. And once that is done, this will be forwarded to the trademark registry of India. So what the trademark, uh, uh, so once that is done, yeah, so actually procedure I will discuss in the coming slides actually, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so, and another primary requirement is a basic application or a basic registration. This simply means that you need to have a national application in your home country, uh, application or registration it could be any, any one of these. And you just have to pay one set of fees and it's only one currency that is the Swiss francs. And the application can be filed in any of these three languages, English, Spanish or French. So the, an exception to this is actually if you're designating a country, if you're choosing a country like EUIP or for a European Union, for example, in that case, you would also have to choose a second language uh, from Spanish or French. So I will explain the general working. Uh, you can just take a quick uh, look at this. I will uh, show you the flowchart of how this works in, the in my next slide. Okay, so I will now explain how th this whole international application thing works, okay? So first of all, I would like to clarify properly that there is no such thing that, you know, you file one international application and you can choose every single country in the world. That's not how it works. There are some countries that have acceded to Medi or accepted the Medi protocol and then there are some countries that haven't and there are some countries that have a completely different procedure itself. So in these countries, you would have to file a direct application. So the Madrid protocol gives you protection in countries that have accepted the Madrid protocol, okay? So with that in mind, I'll just explain how the Madrid system works, right? So you file an, a, a national, so based on a national application, either pending or registered, you will file a international application and you will select the um, countries that you want to um, file your application and or protect your trademark in. So each of these countries would have separate uh, set of documentary requirements Requirements. So, for example, if you are selecting US, uh, you would have to file a declaration of uh, or statement of use of um, mark, uh, for example, in US. Or there are countries like European Union where you need a second language and you also have to file a certification of use. So, it dep depending on which country you want to select, the documentary requirement would be adjusted accordingly, right? So, you will file this application with the office of origin. So, they, you would have to pay a nominal fees, uh, handling fees, I think, to the office of origin. So, once the office of origin receives this what they will do they will cross verify the details of the international application and the national application make sure that all of this is in order okay so and if that is okay and there is no deficiency in that point in time what they will do they will certify the internet certify the particular international application and they will forward this to WIPO that is the world intellectual property organization right so once it reaches the WIPO you will pay the requisite fees to WIPO uh, directly in Swiss francs for whatever uh, countries is it that you have designated. So once the WIPO receives that, it will do its own scrutiny check and that scrutiny check would be based on not only the national application but the uh, rules and regulations that have been mentioned in the Madrid protocol as well. Right, and if it is in conformity with you know all of the guidelines and rules and regulations of the metric protocol, what if it will assign a international registration number? It will issue the WIPO will issue a certificate of international registration first, and it will allot an IR number or the international registration number, and it will notify this in the. Uh, it will publish that uh, publish that yeah, something uh, an international application uh, international registration has been recorded, and it will record it in the WIPO gazette. Okay, so once it is published in the WIPO Gazette, this particular uh, information that, you know, there have, an international application has been filed and uh, these particular countries have been selected. So this information will be notified to each of the countries that you have selected while you were filing the application. So from the date, when, so once this enters the national phase, that is, 
the WIPO notifies that particular country that, hey, you've been designated and someone wants to protect their mark in your country. When it receives that communication from WIPO, they will allot their own national application number to that particular trademark application. And once it, so that would be the national phase once it enters the country uh, as such, right? So once it enters, all of the examination process will happen according to the rules and regulations of that particular country. So, and regardless, so all of the filing requirements would be completed till the WIPO. And after that, the examination part, all of that will happen as per the rules and regulations of each individual country. So in these each individual country, in case there are let's say objections or oppositions or you know it is not in conformity with the rules and regulations of that particular the trademark the trademark system of that particular country this uh, particular country will issue objections or in international registrations uh, it's called a provisional refusal either an objection or an op or a third party opposition it will be called a provisional refusal so this will be notified to wipo directly by the contracting office or the country that you have selected and WIPO will notify the home country or the, uh, the agent who has filed the application uh, from the home country that, hey, something like this has come, the provisional refusal has come, and you have to file the re appropriate response within these many days. And that kind of time period, so this differs from country to country as per their rules and regulations. Okay, so this is this is the general idea of how it works. So if there is no objections or if the objections have been overcome or whatever, then uh, the mark will proceed towards registration and with respect to international registrations, it will be called a statement of grant or the mark will be granted protection in these particular countries, wherever you're designated. So this is the general working. Okay, now let's discuss direct application. Direct application, very straightforward. You file, you uh, engage a local council, you file an individual application in the particular country that you want to designate, right? Uh, like, for example, you want to um, protect your trademark in uh, UAE or EU IPO, uh, in European Union or United Kingdom. You identify a council there or you find a council who has contacts with the council there and you file the application over there, right? That's how it works. Now, with certain territories, it's always recommended that you file a direct application. And this here's why, okay? So there are some countries like US or uh, Bahrain, or there are some countries where the filing requirements are very strict. Like uh, the from just particulars to uh, how you the 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 uh, goods in the description of the goods and services or the documentary requirements or something as basic as you know how in how in india there is uh, absolute grounds and relative grounds to uh, es to establish the distinctiveness of a particular mark for each country there would be separate set of laws that govern the distinctiveness of that particular mark right and that differs from country to country so when you file an international application as easy as it may sound and as convenient as it may sound it becomes very difficult in the long run, sometimes with respect to certain countries, because it is slightly more difficult to establish or um, understand the registrability of the mark and you know the risk factors that are associated with registering that in that particular mark. While in many cases you designate a particular country and it goes forward without any objections, say any objections where to come from these registries, then you would have to go and engage a local council in that particular territory and then they would have to do the rest of the prosecution in that particular territory. Uh, okay, so the advantages and disadvantages I will, dis I will be discussing in the coming slides. So, um, and uh, another thing is determination of first to use and first to file territories. So for people who are looking to register and first to use territories, for example, like say India or um, USA, for example, right? Um, if I were to know, if I as a business owner were to know that, you know, I was, I had my business in India, uh, but I am only registering it now, right? Like since, uh, let me just file an international uh, trademark application and designate India. So I would not have the edge I, I would have had if I just filed a direct application in India through a user affidavit claiming use for all of those years that I have actually run my business there. So because I did not claim that now I've lost my right to claim uh, use otherwise uh, uh, or else if so this is assuming that it proceeds to its registration without any objections of course you can always adduce use at a later stage provided you're engaging a council in the territories but that again is more of a work had you just you know approached the council directly to file its applications right mm -hmm. 
Okay, so let me just give you some examples um, regarding this, right? So I think that would be better. Now, UAE, for example, like you can also save a, a lot in the cost with respect to direct application. So in countries like UAE or GCC, right? So there, there are stage-wise uh, fee payment. So for application, there is one set of fees. For publication, there is one set of fees. For registration, there is one set of fees. So with method application, you just pay the entire amount upfront, right? If there's no stage by payment. So if that mark were to, you know, get rejected, right, you're losing the entire money there. If you were to file a direct application, if at all, even if it gets objection, right, the, the fees that you would pay there till that stage would be still nominal, right? So that is one of the factors. And then there are some, um, and the filing requirements also is very different from country to country. In countries like GCC, uh, um, so what all of the documents that you're going to be filing required to be embassy attested. It has to be attested by the uh, UAE or the, the respective embassy of the of, in that particular country. So that is actually a little tiresome, but then uh, for you to enable your applications in, uh, in the long run, I think that would be helpful. But in countries like uh, EU, um, European Union or United Kingdom, it is a little more relaxed. Like all you need would be the particulars of the applicant, the, the details and the, you know, the description of the trademark and the goods and services for you to register. So it's literally a lot more relaxed. Okay. Then, then there are countries like Saudi Arabia, where um, Saudi Arabia is one of the examples, right? So uh, there is this system of classification of goods and services called a nice classification, where all of the goods are categorized, goods and services are categorized into 45 classes. So there are some goods and services that certain countries just do not accept or register. So one of the examples would be if you go to GCC countries, like uh, Saudi Arabia especially, um, they do not accept items like coke or alcohol or anything. So, they, so these are just one of the examples that I'm giving you with respect to the restrictions that uh, certain countries might have. Now, when you're going through the method protocol, you may not be aware of all of these office actions that, uh, that actually happen. But if you had just approached the local attorney, you would have a proper understanding of what are the risk factors that are associated, what is it that you can protect in that particular country. So that is the general benefit that I was talking about. Okay. Next, let's see, let's just compare Madrid and direct application. So um, both are good and bad equally, um, but all of that comes down to the kind of business that you run, the strategy that you are going to opt and the, the strength of your trademark, right? Um, you have already covered a strong trademark, so um, I, you will need an information uh, going forward as well when I'm explaining this. Uh, so, Medri root the advantages. Of course, cost savings and convenience. You do not, if you uh, want to protect your trademark in, say, some 18 countries, you do not have to find 18 attorneys in 18 countries and pay each and every one of them. You can file a single application from here, pay the government fee, and just um, it is just extremely convenient for you to file that application, right? And it is a single application. Of course, it's just single set of fees. You don't have to, you know, wait for the conversion rate. Or you don't have to worry about uh, what is going to the cost for the professional fee. So it is very convenient and it is cost effective as well. Um, centralized processing. So the WIPO, as I said, centrally processes these applications. So there is uh, the ease of renewal, like the attorney or whoever is filing the application from the home country, they itself they they can renew that application. Uh, and all of the designations, right? All of, in all of the countries, this particular mark will be renewed automatically. You don't have to separately go to each country and renew this particular mark, right? And uh, recording amendments, for example, uh, you have a name change, your company's name has changed or the address has changed and some small amendments like that, right? You don't have to individually go to each country and record this. You can simply file a request with WIPO directly and it will be recorded to uh, record in each of these countries um, in due course and this will be notified by WIPO itself directly. You don't have to do anything about this. Because there is also because there is an exam uh, mandated examination time, right? So with metric application, there is a mandatory examination time of 18 months. So from the time an international registration number is issued, you have 18 months with uh, the country, each of the country that you have designated, it has 18 months to uh, oppose, to object to the particular trademark or issue a provisional refusal. 
So if it does not, uh, within these 18 months, if it does not issue that, then it is deemed that the uh, mark is registered and the statement of uh, grant will be provided, right? So this actually eases up a lot of your work uh, uh, compared to a national route because uh, taking Indian registry itself, for example, there are plenty of marks that have been due for examination for say three, four years, five years, but they're still under examination. And, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of delay or inconvenience won't happen when it goes to many protocol because there is a mandatory time limit. Okay. So the registry's discretion as such in, in, in with respect to time or no would be limited uh, quite a bit. Now, with respect to direct road cost savings, uh, so cost savings would be primarily if you're going to, if you're looking for specific markets. So there are a lot of people from India who are looking exclusively for GCC markets or exclusively for EU IPO markets or exclusively in the USA or UK or such markets. So depending on your business, your markets will be very specific, right? So there, if you are only going to protect in these particular jurisdictions, right, and your the number of countries what you want to uh, what you want to protect in is limited, then direct food makes the most sense because you need also you also need to determine the registrability, the strength of your mark, and every risk factor that is associated with the mark, and not only that, you need to identify who are the potential infringer and need to keep the watch on who, uh, any person that is going to possibly infringe your trademark. So for that, you would, uh, a direct application is highly, highly recommended. And you would also have the attorney as assistance in determining the registrability or any sort of risk factors that are associated with filing an application. Now, disadvantages. So like I mentioned before, um, there is a dependence of, so for you to file a measured application in the first place, right, an international application in the first place, you need to first have a national application or a national registration in your home country. So, for example, you have a national application that you filed about two, three months back and it is pending now and uh, you have filed an international application parallelly. Now, the registry uh, issues an examination report and your mark is in objective stage. Two months later, hearing happens, your mark is refused. So what happens? This directly Im uh, impacts your international application. So the because the basic application or the national application itself ceases to you know exist, the international application shall no longer exist as well. So all of the money that you spent filing that international application, going through all of these process, would be repetitive, right? So that is going to be very difficult, right? So this is one of the biggest risk factors that are that is there for the medal route, right? And there is also non-representation in countries. Um, so with Madrid Road, right, so oftentimes it goes forward without objections or oppositions. But let's say there was an objection, but then the registry did not notify it or you did not engage an attorney uh, to prosecute that particular application and you don't know what is happening with that application in that particular country, right? That also creates kind of a complication in these particular countries. Then another thing is engagement of multiple, engagement of multiple councils Assuming that, you know, a provision refusal or objections were issued by the uh, by these individual countries uh, in a merit application. So even though you, you might be possibly uh, positively uh, saving costs on filing a merit application because you don't actually have to engage any attorney to file your application in these countries, in case, uh, God forbid, some objection comes up tomorrow then all of this is waste because you have to again go forward and uh, engage a local attorney then and you don't know how much that would possibly cost, right? And the, another limitation is, uh, as I mentioned, it only extends to uh, territories that have accepted the merit protocol. Another thing is short deadlines. Um, so like I said, the response time to office actions uh, that are issued by these individual countries that differ from country to country. Like for some countries, it may be 15 days. For some countries, it may be one month or six months or whatever it is, right? So wherever, by the time WIPO notifies us of that something like this has happened, our, our, the deadline for us to respond also becomes extremely short. So this is one of the challenges as well uh, in medical drugs. Uh, and now direct road disadvantages. The first and the most obvious one is uh, multiplicity of application. If you want to file five different applications and maintaining, you know, uh, the contacts of different attorneys, maintaining its applications, the renewal dates, recording of amendments, everything, 
uh, is very time consuming it's very difficult um and you know so the the ease that might be there with the metered route with respect to this might not be might not extend to the direct road as well and also you have to uh, strictly adhere to the national laws even at the time of filing like like i mentioned before for countries like gcc right you have to have a embassy attested documents and you know that is a very time consuming procedure and you know uh, the the fact that you know only some goods can be uh, protected the fact that you have to file disclaimers sometimes even though you don't want to in some territories like uh, in some territories relative grounds that are um, that say a similar mark was existing on the register before you that would be given more weightage right like i said first to file territories um but there are some countries the uh, there are some countries like for example uae right uae or uh, some other countries as well actually the uh, us also actually in some point some points um in india descriptive marks are actually the descriptive and relative runs both uh, marks that are not distinctive and if there are similar marks both are given equally the objections will be given but there are some territories like these they for them descriptiveness is still okay for example descriptiveness is like if you use bottle for bottles right so descriptive terms are still okay but if there was a person who has registered something called bottle for bottles before you right they would be still given weightage regardless of whether or not it's descriptive right so this is something that is difficult as compared to the merit route where you can you, you can uniformly protect your mark in uh, several jurisdictions at once okay now how do you choose which is best for you uh, put simply i would suggest uh, engaging an attorney so they can advise you better in this matter but i will still give you a general overview on how to choose this right how to make the decision now metric protocol is suitable for entrepreneurs that have a registered trademark application so if you have a pending trademark application the risk factor is extremely high if you have a registered trademark trademark application even if any adversarial action has been issue, uh, issued or initiated against it at a later date it will still take a lot of time for it to conclude okay so that becomes very difficult right so um it's always preferable if you have a registered trademark application and based on that you go for merit to to make sure that your chances of success are relatively higher and if you have business plans on a global scale right if you are a business like for example pharma or um, you know those sectors or service industries like if you are a consulting firm the consumer base is going to be very wide okay for businesses like that they might consider merit protocol um difficulty okay so if you have difficulty in identification or you know engaging counsel in a lot of territories at once right so that for them also merit protocol is um, suggested and strong trademarks like i mentioned before if you are if your mark is say a coin or something you just made up right so that you are 100% sure that that's going to be a distinctive mark right that getting uh, objections for these kind of marks are relatively less regardless of which country you filing so that gives you a better edge over other trademarks so in that case also you might consider filing a merit protocol route national application is suitable for uh, people who are looking to expand to specific markets either you may have contacts or you may have a, you may be looking to appeal to a particular consumer base then it makes sense for you to go to the national route because you know what is the market that you want to expand to and what is the consumer that you are looking for okay and in case if you have any risk factors or for example your mark is slightly descriptive or suggestive or there are high chances of objection and it's still pending then it makes sense for you to file a direct application okay i hope i was able to give some insight uh, into the general procedure uh, now let me just cover uh, general ip protection measures first of course is registration like i've already mentioned along with the procedure second one is trademark watching and surveillance so regardless of whether or not you register your mark right like you have to uh, make sure that no other potential infringer is going to use your mark or apply for your mark so for that it's always uh, it, it, it's always recommended that you uh, enroll in a trademark watching service then also you can do certain online monitoring and domain name monitoring and uh, make sure that you renew and maintain your trademarks uh, continuously and make sure that you have a general watch on you know what are the potential uh, trademarks that come into the market and also institute necessary um, adversarial actions or infringement suits or such other actions against 
uh, potential infringers. With that, I'm concluding my presentation. Uh, and if it's okay, let's move on to the Q&A. Very well, thank you, uh, Advocate Rishya and Advocate Nitisha. I'm sure uh, the audience has got a gist of um, a trademark registration in its totality. Uh, indeed, it was a pleasure hearing them explain uh, almost every aspect that would be required to know. Uh, we now move on to the Q&A session. Uh, we had received a few questions and uh, we will be discussing them as uh, the time uh, has crossed a uh, lot much and we're happy the audience is still with us. So we'll just move on to the Q&A session and uh, it will be answered by the panelists in um, together uh, as per the questions. The first question that we have received is here. Um, is trademark registration mandatory in the national country to file a trademark application under the Madrid protocol? Uh, so as Drisha has already explained this concept, uh, like registration uh, is not mandatory, but it is always advisable that you get a registration in the national country and then proceed in the Madrid protocol because if your mark gets refused in a stage in the national phase, then your application is likely, like it is uh, the other applications in other countries will also be refused subsequently. So it is better that you get a registration and then proceed uh, with the uh, applications in Madrid protocol. Okay. Um, I think the next question would be a pretty, um, you know, inquisitive one for the audience. Uh, is there a way to conduct a global search? How do I oppose the trademark or prevent registration of my trademark in a different country? Okay. Um, so now there is a way for you to, in theory, there is a way for you to conduct a global trademark search as such. So there is something called the global trademark uh, database, global brand database, where you can actually conduct a trademark search in general. But um, that is not foolproof because a lot of trademark registries, what they do, they only re record a particular trademark, right? One after registration, including India, uh, UAE and certain other countries, Singapore and certain other countries, you can't actually see pending trademark applications. You can only see registered trademark applications. So that way, it, uh, even though there is technically a system, uh, it is not very foolproof. And this only this particular search only extends to protocol territories. Uh, if you want to conduct a comprehensive search, so for there are a lot of countries where the search, for conducting a search, you have to pay a separate set of fees. It's not free for all of the countries as such. So that actually becomes um, a little difficult, actually. So I guess uh, there is, but then not very foolproof. Uh, what was the second point? Uh, just a second, please. The second point was, how do I oppose the trademark or prevent registration of my trademark in a different country? Right. Um, so uh, prevent oppositions or institute suits, like I said, like you have to conduct, you have to diligently conduct trademark watch and trademark surveillance services in these particular countries or whichever country you want, you seek protection in to make sure that you're updated on a potential infringer. Then you can engage a council to institute adversarial proceedings against uh, these particular marks in those particular territories. Okay. The next question is, uh, can trademark registration be secured before starting to use it? Is there a mandate uh, to use the trademark once the name gets registration? Uh, so uh, yes, trademark applications can be filed on a proposed to be used basis, but uh, you will have to make sure that uh, you use the trademark once the registration has been secured because there are provisions under different laws uh, where if you are not using a trademark for a specific period, then uh, you, you may lose the trademark I mean, the registration. You may lose the registration over your mark. So it is better that uh, you start using your trademark once the same is being registered. Okay, uh, we move on to our last question. Uh, how does one protect his trademark in a different country where same or similar mark is already registered? Okay, um, so this would be, you would simply have to devise a strategy for you to register your mark, right? Um, so if it's a first to use country, I would suggest finding a user affidavit claiming usage uh, in that particular country, provided that you've been using the business over there. Um, and if it's a first to file country and you know you don't have a lot of options then, and if, uh, if there are differences in specifications, like for example, your goods and services are different, then you can actually claim that also to overcome objections. 
But um, if it is difficult that like you have an identical mark or very similar mark registered in that particular country, maybe the chances are very less. But what you can do is you can devise strategy like uh, maybe add a prefix or a suffix or um, add a add a visual element or a visually uh, artistic device to the mark so that you know there is the distinctiveness that is vested in the mark would be more higher. So that way you can get more of an edge in uh, registration of that mark. I guess you can strengthen the success rather. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Advocate Rishya and Nijisha. Uh, we now come towards um, the end of the webinar. I'm sure they were, there may be a lot of clarifications people still need, or you may have certain doubts to clarify. So please do feel free and contact us on global IP at legacypartners.ae. You can also visit our website and uh, get the clear details and, uh, you know, book appointments with our uh, professionals and uh, get your uh, doubts clarified. We now come towards the end of the webinar. I take this opportunity to once again thank all of you uh, to have uh, attended this webinar and uh, participated immensely towards this um, webinar. And uh, I'm, I'm truly hoping that you all have learned much from this. Thank you so much. And um, we hope to see you in many more webinars ahead.